We bring you great news from the great state of Vermont. Remember December 20th, 1999, when the Vermont Supreme Court changed the world as we knew it forever. I want to introduce you to two extraordinary Vermonters, Beth Robinson and Susan Murray. And ladies and gentlemen, from the bottom of my heart, I wish for each and every one of you the exact same opportunity for inclusion and respect that we now have in Vermont. The struggle for marriage equality is an ongoing struggle. It's not by over. In the civil rights movement, I saw with my own eyes that you cannot have equality for some and not equality for all. Everyone must be included. Everyone must have a place at the table. What Susan and Beth did was in keeping with what Rosa Parks and others did. One morning, I came into work and I read about a car accident in the newspaper. A woman had died and another woman who had been driving was severely injured. And there was an 18 month old little boy in the back seat. And there was this horrible insinuating kind of story about the fact that the woman who had died and the woman who was driving the car were in this relationship. The dead woman's parents were coming up to Vermont to take the, the little baby. And I just couldn't, I just couldn't, uh, I couldn't, I couldn't stand that. And I represented her through the custody battles. There were a lot of people living in this state, in the shadows, in exactly this kind of a relationship outside of the, the purview of the law. And because I was in the newspaper, they started coming to see me. So I, that's how I developed a gay and lesbian legal practice, family law practice. In the 1980s and even into the 1990s, gay people were under siege. We certainly had no legal right to marry. We had no state level recognition of our families whatsoever. When I first started in law in 1987, I literally saw contracts that said a person could be fired from their job simply because they're gay. The whole history of our Constitution is the story of including those who were once excluded. In 1996, no state allowed marriage. And part of the purpose of the Federal Defense of Marriage Act was to invite states to discriminate against same-sex couples. And states accepted that invitation with alacrity. People were losing their kids in custody cases. People were being discriminated against even after years of military service. It's difficult for people today to appreciate how recently things were horrible. I first met Beth, I think it was the summer of 1987. I was a brand new intern, uh, summer law clerk at the, at the law firm at Lang Roxbury and Wall. I saw some of the important work Susan was doing, especially as it related to lesbian and gay families. I quickly realized that a lot of the legal protections that heterosexual married couples don't even think about weren't there for same-sex couples. Susan quickly became a professional mentor to me and it was the beginning of a fast friendship. Beth is a small and incredible bundle of energy and always has been. And I've met a lot of smart people in my lifetime, but she is an exquisite legal mind. But she was also a blast. She would eat nothing but pixie sticks. She would just eat pixie sticks after pixie sticks. That was her sugar fix. I grew up in Indiana, but I was part of a big happy family, wonderful parents. As a young girl, I was enthralled by Atticus Finch and, and To Kill a Mockingbird. I don't want to make too much of it, but I think the notion of a small town lawyer who helps their neighbors and can be relied upon to do the right thing, even when doing the right thing might make them unpopular, I mean, what's not to admire about that? My parents were the epitome to me of what it was like to be a committed married couple. They sacrificed everything for their kids. I knew I was 
gay probably fairly early on as a teenager, but that was not a time when there was even such a word as lesbianism. I eventually came out to my parents when I met someone and it was hard on them uh, initially. They went to a counselor who actually happened to be a Roman Catholic nun. And apparently the nun told them, asked them whether I was happy. And my parents said, yes. And the, and the nun said, then don't worry about it. <laughs> that was the response. And so that's where, they, that's where they ended up. Karen and I met in 1986 at our friend's house. We were all gonna sit down and watch The Wizard of Oz. And we just hit it off. And then we just kept talking and we've been talking ever since. Uh, Mary Bonato and Evan Wolfson were the earliest and most persuasive voices on these questions of marriage equality. And that was very important to my own evolution on the issue. In early 1994, I pulled together lawyers from around the six New England states to meet at GLAD and to talk about the opportunity that we now had to really pursue the marriage issue. There were people at the table who thought this was a folly even reckless. Beth and Susan clearly said there was a path forward in Vermont. In 1994, Beth and I set up a little workshop. This is for the, this is for the annals. Hello. Hi, Beth. Susan? Susan, this is for the historical record. Say hello. Hello. <laughs> One of the questions I asked was, what do you think about taking on the idea of working toward marriage for gay couples. And most of the people in the room said, that sounds like a terrible idea. I remember them talking about, we have this goal of establishing marriage in Vermont. And there was a group of us and we were sitting there and I have to tell you, I was like, marriage? Really? The only discussion about gay marriage was happening out in Hawaii, you know, what's 6,000 miles away from Vermont. I was co-counsel in the Hawaii case, but ultimately, we didn't succeed in Hawaii. And the reason was we weren't as effective in making the case in the court of public opinion as we were in making the case in the court of law. By 1995, Beth and I, along with about a half dozen other volunteers, formed the Vermont Freedom to Marry Task Force. We had no money and a lot of energy. We knew that this wasn't going to succeed if it was the gay community by itself. This had to be something that fair-minded Vermonters, uh, you know, across the political spectrum embraced. Beth Robinson and uh, Susan Murray had this kind of traveling roadshow. They would go to the county fairs. They'd set up their table. And the goal was to just tell stories, to introduce gay and lesbian couples to people in an unexpected place. And believe me, a county fair would be an unexpected place to meet a, a gay rights advocacy group. Joseph Watson uh, and another volunteer built this giant booth. It was, it was eight feet high and 16 feet wide. It, it filled an entire space at the fair. I remember sitting in the booth, kind of nervous, and I see a guy, dirty jeans, flannel shirt, John Deere cap, and I think, oh, this is one of these hostile encounters we've been training people for. And he stops and pauses and says, my son is gay. I love him dearly and I'm glad you're here. And then he turns and walks away. And I realize I've just engaged in exactly the kind of stereotyping that I'm asking other people not to engage in. And it, it, it was an eye-opening moment. At some point, we had to decide, was there going to be a marriage case, and if so, when? And in 1996, I drove up to Beth's home. Susan was there. And we sat down and talked about what would be ahead. And we believed, all three of us believed, that we each had something unique to offer. I think in the early days, I was the undisciplined, impulsive one of the, of the group. Really? Why really? Do you say that? I don't know, because people say that. No. <laughs> Yeah. No, I, I can tell you that I felt, I mean, I was just a brand new lawyer, and suddenly I was sort of hanging out with a giant in the movement and a giant in Vermont. I mean, I, I think over time we sort of, I, you know, there, we, we, I caught up, hopefully. I'm not a giant, but I mean, like, <laughs> equalized. I, I felt more like a peer, but I think at first I felt like the summer intern. You came in like, oh, I'm this new lawyer and so on, but you were on everything. 
you were had the, you asked the most incisive questions mm -hmm. completely like exactly. had analyzed everything yeah. so the two of you I just felt like don't give me this Mary gave Beth and I some some street cred if you would some credibility with the national legal groups because there might be some tendency to think that we might be some yahoos who didn't know what we were doing so there were a lot of people from outside of Vermont that wanted to try to control this case and Mary said no you know that's not going to happen. This is a Vermont case. These are Vermont lawyers. This is going to be a Vermont matter. Mary didn't care whether Beth and Susan got credit, and Beth and Susan didn't care whether Mary got credit. And that characterized, I think, their relationship from the very beginning. We were looking for three plaintiff couples who were going to be rock solid as couples, who were articulate, and willing to go through the trouble of being in front of the media and working really hard, you know, without complaint. Ultimately, um, the folks that, that we all know and love as the plaintiffs in the Baker case, each of them brought something different to the mix, uh, and each of them brought something vital to the mix. Polly and Lois. When we first ran into them, they were together for 25 years already. They'd already raised a child. They'd done incredible amounts of volunteer work, building for Habitat for Humanity, riding their bicycles across country for the Girl Scouts, very active in their church. And they just wanted to get married. What do I love about Lois? Wow. She's kind, she's caring, she's gentle. Okay, so that's a dollar, 75, $2, seven, please. Holly and I have been together 41 years, one month and five days. Holly is my companion, my friend. We share a lot. How do we meet? <laughs> Whoops. I was teaching a statistics class and there was this very attractive, gray-haired, lanky woman and it turns out it was Lois. And we did behave ourselves. We didn't do any what one would now call dating until after the semester was over. That's Jay Schmidt, wasn't it? Yeah. We just decided that we would spend the rest of our lives together. Stan and Peter are two of the most gentle people. Stan's a, a, a therapist and now actually an Episcopal priest. And Peter's a um, musical theater professor. When I came out publicly in midlife, I dated some other guys and that was fun, but it wasn't love. But with Peter, there's something he radiated in his intelligence and his maturity and in his innocence. It was clear he was deeply special. Stan, he's very handsome. Uh, he's funny. He's understanding. He really allows me to be myself um, in a much deeper way than I ever really thought I could. Stacy and Nina brought this wonderful energy and they brought their child with them, Noah. I met Stacy doing martial arts, which is something that's near and dear to both of our hearts. She has a very unique way of looking at the world and had a strong sense of spirituality. And I felt very drawn to that. Nina's unbelievably sexy. She's 58 years old, and I still think she blows away any woman in any room. And it's pretty amazing to have that alive after 23 years. On June 17th, 1997, Peter and I went into the Shelburne Town Clerk's office and said, we would like a marriage license. And she didn't want to say no. And yet the laws of the state said that she had to say no. Once the town clerks denied their request for marriage licenses, it was really our turn as the lawyers to take it from there. Three homosexual couples filed a lawsuit today challenging a Vermont state law that prohibits same-sex marriages. The plaintiffs say the ban violates the Equal Protection Clause in the state constitution. All of a sudden, we were the center of attention. Life got 
complex, if not crazy. I'm the pastor of the Cambridge United Church. I've been married to my wife, Deb, for 39 years. Yes, 39 years. Homosexual behavior is a desecration of the very image and reality of who we are as human beings. Early on, we got uh, leaders together. We got input from the folks in Hawaii. We got a scope of what the battle was going to be. We determined we were the ones that would have to be getting together to do something about it. Good morning. I'm Beth Robinson. I'm thrilled to work with Susan Marie and her case, and I'm honored to work with these clients that These clients want to get married. They want to marry each other for the same reasons that many people want to marry each other. They love each other. They want to make a public legal commitment to one another. Their lives are already intermingled emotionally, socially, and financially. And they seek the legal protections and responsibilities that flow from civil marriage. To Beth's right are uh, Lois Farnham and her partner of 25 years, Holly Puderbar. To Mary's left are Stan Baker and Peter Harrigan. There's a third couple involved in this lawsuit, Stacey Jollis and Nina Beck. Unfortunately, Stacey and Nina could not be here today. Uh, yesterday, their two and a half year old son was rushed to the hospital with a serious medical condition. So obviously that takes precedence over this press conference. Noah was our first child. He was born with a heart condition. People called him the Buddha. He was a very old and wise spirit. Noah died August 29th, waiting for a heart transplant at Boston Children's Hospital in my arms. They didn't know what to do with us. They came, the man came to sign a death warrant and the mother's name, fine, they put that in the spot and the father's name and we told them Stacy's name could go there. And he could not get that. He was like, could not understand that. I literally sat with this man for at least an hour trying to explain to him my relationship to Noah. And finally, a friend who was there with us said, just put her name there. And in the end, he did. Beth and Susan were right there with us with Noah. They um, asked if we wanted to step out of the lawsuit at that point. Um, and for me, there was no way I would step out of the lawsuit. It was more important than ever to protect the rights of children um, who had gay or lesbian parents. In December of 1997, the Superior Court issued an order saying that the towns did not violate the Constitution by denying the licenses. So we we're on our way to the Vermont Supreme Court, and it consumed all of us every day. We'd spend hours on the phone going through things line by line. And this went on for months uh, before we finally felt like our briefs were polished enough and ready to file in the Vermont Supreme Court. When the Baker case came into the Attorney General's office, we had to come up with what we thought were plausible reasons for the legislature to have said that marriage would be between one man and one woman. And we came up with about six different rationales. Normally, a brief to the Supreme Court would be 30 pages long, and we got permission to make it longer. In fact, our brief was over 90 pages long. At some point, um, we had to make a decision about who was going to argue the case in front of the Vermont Supreme Court. It was actually my call, um, I being the senior partner. From my perspective, Mary couldn't do it because she wasn't a Vermonter. And then between Beth and me, I thought that Beth was the better person to argue it. She's a uh, brilliant mind and really had all of the constitutional law um, issues at her fingertips. I felt a lot of pressure, but, um, but I was also thrilled to be doing it. I knew that if I fell flat on my face and embarrassed myself in front of my colleagues and the community and the plaintiffs and everybody who was counting on me, I still had someone to come home to who was gonna uh, support me come hell or high water. But it wasn't as though Kim was home waiting for me with my slippers at the door. She was in medical school and then she was a resident and then she was starting her medical practice. And so uh, we were both running around like maniacs. 
In order to get ready for an oral argument of this magnitude, you don't just read the briefs the night before and say, oh, okay, I think I'm ready. We really struggled with how to put together the argument. And I desperately wanted to get away from just the legal pieces. I wanted to tell a story. We gathered lawyers in Boston, and Beth made a presentation, and they critiqued her approach. And they said, that just wasn't right. There's something wrong. It just was off. And we drove back to Vermont, and I have a very distinct memory of being in Beth's living room. I think it was a Sunday night. And she said, how about this? I said, Susan, I want to try out something on you. And so I tried out this introduction that I had been thinking about. And it was a story not about a same-sex couple. It was about a court in California in 1948 that found itself in a very similar situation. And it talked about all the parallels. And it talked about what that court did. And I just went, that's it. That's it. That's it. She had it. Finally, the day came, people lined up outside the Supreme Court building. They handed out tickets to the oral arguments. The courtroom itself was full. There were radio and television reporters from around the world. They set up chairs in this large room outside, and they carried video out there so everyone could see it. I think the first thing that struck me walking into the courtroom is I'd never seen it so crowded. You know, there was an atmosphere there that was, uh, was unusual uh, and extraordinary. the court. The question in this case is not whether we in this room as individuals approve of a policy that permits same-sex couples to marry. The question in this case is rather whether the legislature, having adopted a marriage statute that permits only opposite-sex couples to marry, has acted unconstitutionally. Planners here seek a right which has never been granted in any state in the United States or in any country in the world. To be in the Vermont Supreme Court on that day was electric. I had enormous confidence in Beth. We all did, and for good reason. Beth is so short she had to put the little step down so she could stand on it, so she could be seen over the dais. And she just started talking, and you could hear a pin drop. Susan Marie, Mary Bonato and I have the privilege of representing this morning Luna Beck and Stacey Jollis, Stan Baker and Peter Harrigan, and Holly Futterbaugh and Lois Farnham. Fifty years ago, the California Supreme Court handed down its decision in the landmark case of Perez versus Lippold, striking down California's ban on interracial marriage. The parallels between that case and this case are striking. It's easy to sit here in 1998 and look back and say that that decision was an easy one. Of course the ban on interracial marriage was unconstitutional. But at the time, 30 of the 48 states in this country prohibited interracial marriage. In fact, six found it so odious that they prohibited it by constitutional provision. Nine out of 10 Americans opposed interracial marriage. In fact, the notion of a black person and a white person marrying was as antithetical to many people's conceptions of what a marriage was as the notion of a man marrying a man or a woman marrying a woman appears to be to the state of Vermont today. It was by far the best oral argument I've ever seen. Um, thank you so much to Mary Bonato from Glass, to Susan Murray from Lyrock Green Wall in Middlebury, and to Beth Robinson, you rock. <laughs> After oral argument, the justice assigned a case. In this case, that would have been me. Um, we'll prepare a draft to circulate it to uh, the other justices. They'll be back and forth on, on the issues. And that process can take the better part of a year. We had a lot to do uh, during that time. Vermont Friends of Ray Task Force was busier than ever. 
Susan and I, we were still working full time and, and then taking these trips on the road. And I can just remember we got out of a meeting. It was a weeknight. It was probably 10 o'clock and we still had a three hour drive home. We hadn't had dinner. I can remember going to some convenience mart and not finding anything that we could stand to eat. I just remember thinking, wow, this is gonna be a long haul. But as exhausting as that was, I also thought, this is fun. Vermont was an unbelievably idyllic, wonderful place to grow up when I was a kid. And it's not nearly as good now. The fourth commandment in the Catholic Church is honor thy father and thy mother. And that withstood 5,700 years of Judeo-Christian history. Now we're gonna take a step and go another direction? Why? Marriage is a foundational institution. Uh, and for me personally, it's the relationship that I have with my wife and, and my children and my grandchildren. Homosexuality from a biblical point of view is harmful to the people, to society, and to their growth and closeness to God. I have heard many of our opponents say that for two women to live together in a marriage, the Bible says that it's an abomination. First thing I would point out is if we believe everything written in the Bible, you better go find yourself slaves because the Bible tells you very carefully how to take care of slaves. In the same chapter where it says that it's abomination for two men to lie together, it also says you should not eat anything on cloves, which takes away pigs. You should not eat shellfish, which takes away shrimp. You should not wear clothes of mixed fiber, which our good normal polyester cotton mixes would be gone. I think love is the real message in the Bible, and it's love at all levels. Between the time of the oral argument and the time that the Supreme Court decision finally came out, we had our second son. Our son, Seth, was born just a month before the decision was announced, and it was wonderful that he was here. He is the most extroverted human being I think you can possibly ever meet. I don't know how two introverts could create such an extrovert, but he genuinely loves people. So the Vermont Supreme Court always issues its decisions on a Friday. I wore the same suit every Friday uh, because it's the suit I wanted to wear for the uh, press conference when the decision came down. People started making fun of me because they see my Friday suit on. I had to switch suits because the suit was really seasonally appropriate for the winter, but not the summer. And the weather started getting cold again, and I went back to my old press conference suit. Uh, so it was, it felt like a long wait. When the Baker decision came out, it was on a Monday morning, and it took everyone by surprise. I got a heads up call from someone I know um, close to the court who said, stand by, we've got a big decision just about to be released. And it was about 10.30 a.m. And our deadline, drop dead deadline, was 10.30 in the morning. And I called my editors and said, hold the presses. It was one of those real hold the press moments. The, the decision is coming over the fax line one very slow page at a time. And it was 80 some odd pages. We had a press conference and we had to read the decision in the car while we were driving up to Burlington. But we did stop at her house on the way so she could change into her suit. A decision from the Vermont Supreme Court today has moved Vermont one step closer to allowing same-sex couples to marry. The decision is being called the first of its kind in the nation. The Vermont Supreme Court says gay and lesbian couples must be granted the same benefits and protections given married couples of the opposite sex. But the high court stopped short of giving gay couples the right to marry, instead passing the issue on to the Vermont legislature. Mary and I got on the phone right after we got the decision and really wrestled with how do we see this? Did we win? Did we lose? The court got the what right, equality, but got the how wrong because the court threw it to the legislature. I had to take the good with the bad, the bitter with the sweet, uh, and move on.
This is the first time that any state Supreme Court in this country has not only recognized that same-sex families exist, but for the first time has recognized that they have the same needs and deserve the same protections and rights as all other couples and families. That's a first. That's a legal and cultural milestone. I, I mean, this came out of left field, and all of a sudden, they find, after 200 years of the Vermont Constitution, special rights for special people. I thought that was a combination of craftiness and cowardness, and both of those made me angry. Beth was devastated by the decision because it was half a loaf, and I was... I was, I was happy with the fact that we had made some progress. When I first heard about marriage equality, I really thought it was not even that great an idea. I'll be candid with you. You know, I remember being called into uh, the governor's office. I was president of the Senate. Howard Dean was governor at the time, and uh, there was very few of us in there. And we were reading the opinion, uh, trying to figure out, first of all, what it meant, and secondly, what we were going to do about it. And we knew that there was a real risk. We knew that there was going to be huge political casualties. Senate leadership was very nervous about this. So they went to uh, Governor Dean at, in a secret meeting, and they said, is there any way we can delay this until after the election? And, he, and Howard said, no, you, we have to do this now. We have to do it. Most people in politics never get to a vote on, on an issue that is critical for the betterment of the country, and at the same time, toxic to their possibility of re-election. When I grew up, it was common, and I did it all the time, to make incredibly unkind and disparaging remarks about gay people. If you had told me that I was going to sign the first marriage equality bill in the United States of America, I would have not only told you you're crazy, I would have tried to kick you in the butt and beat you up. The morning after the Baker decision came down, I picked up the phone and called Beth and Susan's law firm, and I got Susan on the phone. I said, as any good pitch man does, hi, I'm Kevin Ellis from Kimball Sherman Ellis. You don't know who I am, and you're now headed into a three-ring circus. Do you have any idea what you're about to face? And she said, no. But I have CNN on the other line. Can I call you back? And they offered to be our lobbyists. And I think we told them, well, that's nice, but we can't pay you. And they said, don't worry about it. Beth and Susan were lawyers. They weren't political organizers. So suddenly, they had to build a political organization from scratch. I was going to a fundraiser for the Vermont Freedom to Marry Task Force, and I met Beth and Susan. They were a brilliant team. Here, you have the best legal minds getting the gay and lesbian community playing politics, hardball politics, hardball electoral politics for the first time ever. Vermont was the stepping stone to all the other states. If it could happen in Vermont, it would happen in the other states. If we could stop it in Vermont, we could stop it in the other states. We started holding rallies, press conferences, lobbying legislatures. We risk throwing away all the things that are inherent in the foundational unit of society. People started calling us and saying, how do we help? What can we do? We had a true grassroots rebellion on our hands in the state of Vermont. We put together an ad. It gets a 13 or 15 point uh, uh, kind of communist, not communist, <laughs> uh, homosexual manifesto. In other words, what they wanted to do in America. That ad ran in every paper in the state, and people were, were calling me up out of the blue. I didn't know who they were. They would write a check for $1,500 and say, can you run this same ad again? The eyes of the political players across the country, anyone that cared about GLBT equality, on our side or against our side, was focused like a laser beam on Vermont.
was decided that the House would start the bill. And so it was assigned to the Judiciary Committee. The House Judiciary Committee was run by uh, Tom Little, who was a Republican and a lawyer and a very even-keeled, great guy. The Judiciary Committee had 11 members, and all political parties, Republicans, Democrats, progressives, independents, we had all walks of life. We had people from all corners of the state. Well, I'm a father, a grandfather, and, and a Republican. I was born and raised here in the state, uh, brought up on a, a dairy farm, and then I uh, became a state trooper. I retired in 92, and in 94, I ran for the House. And then in the Supreme Court decided the Baker case. Well, I said, oh my God, I know my district and I know the people in Franklin County and I knew how they felt about, about this issue. And I frankly thought I knew how I felt. Members of the House Judiciary Committee, depending on their political background, were either terrified or excited that we were taking this on. Our chair, Tom Little, began to bring in people to testify. He brought in the attorney general. He brought in constitutional scholars from both sides of the issue from all over the country. And then we had clergy come in. And uh, I gotta tell you, I'd rather deal with the lawyers than the clergy. <laughs> Susan and I, I think we were the first witnesses in the House Judiciary Committee. All eyes were on that committee room. People were nervous. Susan and I had the first shot at making the case. And I don't think I did a very good job. I treated it like an argument before a court. And word came back pretty quickly that the committee really hadn't warmed up to me. They didn't like me. And it might have just been fatigue, but something happened that caused me to become emotional. And I got up and left the room. So I made a beeline for the women's bathroom. And a couple of the women on the House Judiciary Committee saw me crying. And we had a little conversation. After that, the ice melted. For me, one of the things I had to learn was to engage at a personal level and, 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 and let yourself experience feelings that you don't as a lawyer. One of the hardest times for me, and, and I think for Peter, was we, we appeared on the, um, the website of the Westboro Baptist Church, and under our picture it said Vermont Fag Beasts, and then there was a column of how evil we were, how we were going to go to hell. It's hard to be seen as evil, but I don't, I don't absorb it. I don't internalize it. I was working as a school nurse. I also taught health education. And two of the parents pulled their kids out of my classes because they didn't want their children taught by a lesbian. I think Vermont was picked by the gay movement as a good place to push for a first victory. And clearly, we're in a sec an era of sexual chaos. So what's at stake? What's at stake for Vermont? What's at stake for the nation now is its children, is its future. Welcome, Dr. Fagan. And what are some of the things that you've discovered in the research that you've done? The intercourse between a male and female is potentially fruitful. It gives life, and it can lead to love, marriage, happiness. And no matter how frequently uh, two gay people or two lesbians come together sexually, they can never, ever, ever produce a child. Uh, there is that fundamental common sense, total worlds apart difference. And to say both are the same is insane. It's hard to get around um, the fact that at some level, the whole opposition is premised on the notion that gay people shouldn't be treated as equals. But having said that, overwhelmingly the folks that I dealt with in the opposition tried to present their views as civilly as they could. Look hard at these images. Pretend, just pretend for a moment, that they're alive and they're standing here in front of you with the full weight and authority of the Vermont legislature would you tell them that they really don't need or deserve a mother? That they really don't need or deserve a father? Because that's exactly what you would be saying by changing the law in marriage. The House 
Judiciary Committee, which had taken testimony every single day for six weeks, had finally decided it was time for them to take the vote. It became pretty clear that the majority of the committee wanted to support some type of legal recognition for gay and lesbian relationships. But there was only a small handful of us who believed that marriage was the right choice or that marriage had any chance of passing on the floor of the House. The only thing I thought about politically is what can you get through? And I knew I couldn't get married through no matter what I did. It was just too scary for people. It is a difficult, uncomfortable time for a lot of people in the state. But I think the legislature is looking into their hearts and trying to do what they think as individuals is the right thing to do. The bill that we ended up calling civil unions gave every right and responsibility to gay and lesbians that had heterosexual people had. It was not for marriage equality, but it was the first legal recognition. I'm quite sure that the legislature will look at all sorts of models, but if it studies the court's opinion and it studies what it is the court's trying to accomplish and what, what the Constitution requires, uh, I, I don't think there's going to be any alternative for full equality short of full equality. So there's 150 members in the House. You need 76 votes to pass anything. So my partner, Steve Kimball, did a count. And for marriage, we had about 23 to 27 votes. So he had to go to Beth and say, we can't win this. Uh, your choice is to get no bill or to settle for uh, civil unions. And that was really hard for her, for both of them, really, really hard. Beth and I had to take a step away. We actually dropped out of the state house for five or six days. We had meetings in person and over the phone conference call meetings with all of the activists around the state who have been working on this for six, seven, eight years and asking them, what do you want to do? Holding out for marriage meant walking away from that legislative session with nothing and going back to the court and saying, OK, court, we want you to finish the job. People looked to me and Susan for leadership on this, and Susan and I weren't um, exactly aligned. Everything that the state of Vermont could give opposite-sex couples who marry, they gave to gay couples in civil unions. So I felt good. I don't think either one of us took it personally if we disagreed with the other. Right. No. Never. It was it never interfered. In fact, I have this. I just knew you were wrong. I just, <laughs> I mean, was... There was a moment there where Beth Robinson had a decision to make. Either she was going to stick to her, her strong understanding of the law and the Constitution and say, this needs to be marriage. Or she could make a political decision, a compromise, and support moving forward with civil unions. And that was an extremely difficult decision for Beth to make. But I think it was brilliant that she made it and it really changed the course of American history. She came back and she said to Steve, OK, let's do it. Let's get civil unions. Montpelier really became quite a war zone. Vermont became ground zero in the battle over gay people in American life and law. We saw all manner of anti-gay opponents flooding the state with money, with troops, busting in their supporters. Don't tell me to watch my mouth while you're over here teaching these children that it's OK to be gay. That is the ultimate goal of this entire movement, to destroy our ability to hold people accountable for their sexual behavior. We're going to protect those civil rights and ensure that people can live together in this state in harmony, in love and in peace as one family, the Vermont family. Randall Terry, the famed anti-abortion crusader, came to town. He set up a storefront a block from the state house and let it be known that he was here to uphold the importance of traditional marriage and uphold everything that traditional marriage means. Randall Terry would tell people that homosexuality was an abomination. We must contain the poison. He came across as someone who was intentionally trying to instill fear in people. And he did, he did that to my, my vice chair, Bill Lippert. Bill Lippert, he was the only openly gay member of the legislature. So he was 
at the eye of the storm. I remember walking through the halls and hearing on a number of occasions, Judgment Day is coming, Representative Lippert. Judgment Day is coming. And I'd turn around, and there was Randall Terry. One day I get a tip. A fellow calls me and says, um, I know Randall Terry's in your town talking up traditional marriage, but maybe it's time he take a look into his own soul. He tells me that Randall Terry had left his wife for another woman, uh, yet he still wore a wedding ring. He didn't obviously want people in Vermont to know that his own traditional marriage didn't work out quite as well as he had hoped for. There were two nights of public hearings. At the time, there were maybe 630,000 people who lived in Vermont. And I'll tell you, a good percentage of them descended on the state house. One of the many great things about the Vermont legislative process was that the legislature wanted to hear not only from experts and advocates, but from all Vermonters who had a perspective to share. There were several statewide hearings in Montpelier where people could come to the state house and testify. I came up for all of those. State House was jammed, jammed, and at some point decided to leave the chamber because I wanted to see what was happening outside. 3,000 people showed up on the front steps of the State House. They are angry. Civil unions is essentially marriage without the marriage work. The people have been lied to, they've been cheated, and that's the anger you have to worry about because it doesn't go away. I went outside, it was freezing. Then I walked among some of the people trying to make eye contact. And I, mean, I was just overcome with this feeling of, these could have been my neighbors growing up and my family members for that matter. I realized when you're in a fight for your common humanity, you cannot discount the common humanity of others. I was really troubled, I, you know, experiencing a lot of angst. I hadn't yet screwed up my courage, but I just thought, you know, I, I've got to make a decision. And I said, I, I've got to be on the right side of this issue. And the right side is to support it. And from that point on, it, it was like a weight lifted from my shoulders. The day the House did their final vote on the law for civil unions, we weren't sure which way it was going to go. It was still up in the air. We speak and we listen to what people have to say. We listen to the other side. We listen to what they have to say. That's the way that we conduct business here and shall continue to do so based on over 200 years of precedent. We were all very nervous. Even Beth and Susan were nervous. But I will not support the legalization of sodomy, the tearing down of traditional marriage in this country by the passage of this law. And I, I truly am, feel sorry for the state of Vermont that this can happen here and for our nation, because I believe that we are really putting ourselves in a dangerous situation in regard to a judgment from the Almighty God. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The, the House was on the floor for hours. It must have been 12 hours. And it was toward the end of that day, it must have been eight or nine o'clock at night, and Bill Lippert rose and spoke, and it was quiet. I think it's very important as we listen, and as we debate, and as we make decisions, that you understand what the reality is about gay and lesbian people, and gay and lesbian couples. Passing the bill that the House Judiciary Committee has brought forward will not end discrimination. It will not end prejudice. It will not end hate. But it will grant rights, the rights that I don't have right now, and most everyone else in this chamber does. Bill's speech was amazing. And because they knew Bill, he was one of them, I think it really hit home. And they finally started the vote. And Lois was keeping track for and against, for and against, and we're counting them. As soon as we saw we had enough votes, it was like, we can relax. Those voting yes, 79. Those voting no, 68. All right, 
congratulations. Thank you, congratulations. It's just an incredible day. It was amazing. We could become legally connected. We had won that step. Gay couples in Vermont will soon get the same rights and benefits as married heterosexual couples. The governor is expected to sign the civil unions bill into law later this week. With that signature, the Green Mountain State will go where no state has gone before. And I think starting today, the healing process now begins. The passage of civil union in Vermont established the principle that we could win, that we could win something bigger than most people had ever dreamed we were going to achieve, state-level recognition of gay families. The magic of Vermont, the magic of civil unions in 2000, the reason why it was so historic was because for the first time ever, gay and lesbian couples statewide had rights and responsibilities and were acknowledged for being couples. We had every reason to celebrate but we weren't done. I knew we had to keep working however long it took to get to full equality, full inclusion. Civil marriage for same-sex couples. Peter and I I uh, had a wonderful civil union. We actually call it our holy and civil union because it took place in the Episcopal Cathedral in Burlington. We declare that they are united and joined to one another as partners in holy and civil union, a solemn and joyful covenant of love in the name of God. Those whom God has joined together, let no one put asunder. <laughs> In 1992, Stacy and I, we had a ceremony that we designed ourselves. I wore my white lace dress and Stacy wore her tails and her top hat. It was totally significant to us, even though it wasn't legal. When civil unions passed, we wanted to have access to those benefits and rights and to be a family in every sense of the word. Our civil union was a beautiful summer day in Vermont. Lots of friends and relatives came. At the same time, there was an anti-civil union demonstration on the Capitol steps, and we had more people in our ceremony than they had in their demonstration. By the end of the day, we will be, believe it or not, legally uh, connected to each other. And it's, it's nice after all this time to be able to say yeah. that all is my spouse. Couples from all over the country, and in fact all over the world, came to Vermont, Little Vermont, for a civil union. When Vermont happened, when civil unions happened, we thought, we want to be as married as two men can be in this country. We want to be as committed to one another as is humanly and legally possible. When I met Tom, marriage wasn't even a part. There was no gay marriage movement. I could write about it in plays, men getting married, but... I didn't think it would be a reality. We heard about this great inn in Vermont and said, let's just treat ourselves with a civil union. I don't think either of us fully knew how perfect that moment would be. I am there for you for the rest of my life. It's a very profound pledge to make to another person, and it makes me feel safer, more protected, happier, calmer. I'm, I'm not alone in the world. As much as I love Tom, I never had that feeling until we stood in Vermont in that inn and said the words to each other. The irony is that it wasn't until after the law passed that things got really ugly in Vermont. Something about the climate changed in a bad way. People who heretofore had been unwilling or unable or scared to express their homophobia and their hatred of gay people suddenly felt like they had permission to do so. The focal point of LGBT equality was going to be decided in these elections. If the Republicans would have taken back control of the House and the Senate and won the governorship, which all was possible, then it would have sent 
shivers across the spines of any politician across America. Groups sprung up all around the state, organized around the idea of, if we don't do something now, they're taking the state away from our kids, and we want our state back. We finally got organized with Take Back Vermont. <laughs> it was, you know, 24-7, pedal to the metal. Before I knew it, we, we became the focus of, uh, of the opposition in Vermont. They were Take Back Vermont signs everywhere, lots of them. And the left went ballistic. I was in demand. I didn't want to be in demand. I didn't want to be a leader of anything. Just wanted to get some information out. But we had started something, and so we were going to see it through. We packaged the videos with other literature, and we, we sent that material to every legislator uh, in the state of Vermont twice. The battle in this country between those holding to traditional morality and those espousing hedonism has reached a fever pitch, manifested in no clearer terms than the ideological conflict over homosexuality. Our view was that the only opportunity we had to try and stop this was to knock the engine, which was Governor Dean, off the tracks. The major reason that I ran for re-election in 2000 was to validate what we had done with civil unions. It was clearly the nastiest time in Vermont politics, certainly since I've been here. I was a Republican nominee. I won my primary, and I was running against Howard Dean. I had run against him in 98 as well. But in 2000, the atmosphere was far more charged I was opposed to gay marriage, I still am. I do believe homosexuality is not the way nature intended people to behave. There was clearly a group of people somewhere, somehow, and that's, I would assume, a national level. Maybe they were international, I don't know. There was clearly people banded together and said, you know, we want to ban guns, we want to legalize abortion, we want whatever we want to do. We want to promote same-sex marriage. Well, how are we going to do that? We'll form a group. We'll find a state. Beth and I believe that our job at that point was to try to help reelect the legislators who had stuck their necks out and had supported civil unions. So we marshaled volunteers and, uh, and raised money and did everything we possibly could. We're here today because so many of our fellow Vermonters had the vision to identify one of the key issues of our time and the courage to stand up and act. These people were there for us. They've taken an incredible amount of heat for us. This is our time to be there for them. <laughs> people like John Edwards from Swanton opened his heart and his mind. And he listened to the testimony for weeks and weeks. We've got Marion Milne, who challenged herself to do the right thing for her grandkids. I was elected as a Republican, but I voted for civil unions. And uh, since then, I've never had one minute of regret. I love being in the House. I thought it was one of the greatest and humbling experiences I've ever had. We are asked to prove whether we are as tolerant and democratic as we say we are. Democratic in the sense that we are willing to recognize the full rights of gay and lesbian Vermonters. After the vote, many houses that I had been to um, that were very friendly to me before, I wasn't welcome in them uh, anymore. One person that I knew and respected called me up. Um, I can't believe Marion lied to me. You lie to the voters, I'll never speak to you again. I had several people uh, that I cared about say that to me. It was a surreal experience. You'd knock on a door and they'd say, oh, you're the gay lover. You'd slam the door in your face. One in particular called me lower than well done. I lost by can probably probably by two to one or better, you know. Uh, and it was it was tough. It was brutal. They got some polling numbers that showed that Ruth Dwyer was going to win, and we knew that if that happened, that was the end of marriage equality in this country for a long, long time. 
So we did lose the House. It went Republican big time. I held the Senate by one single vote, and it was very hard to hold. And people don't remember this, but Howard Dean won re-election by one single point in this state. When I lost the election, I really, really suffered for a long time because I felt I had let some very good people down. Now I pretty much raise dogs and horses and cows and live on a farm. I like to be around the animals because they're simple, <laughs> unaffected, predictable, and, you know, they have the right priorities. After the election, and we all recuperated, um, many of the leaders within Take Back Vermont formed an organization that was ultimately called Vermont Renewal. Uh, the gay and homosexual lobby is expansive. And so uh, we went into the schools. We were able to eliminate a lot of that material that was clearly propaganda. I mean, there were six resource libraries that we had shut down. But when they start teaching that all of these ways of living together are equal and the same, right. and you have children involved in it, are they right. uh, you know, it's, then where do you draw the line, as others have said? What's, what's wrong with having three people in this situation or two people and a dog? Yeah. yeah. You don't even understand what freedom is until it's challenged. It's true. And that's when we realized how Hitler or somebody like that could come to power. I yes. never thought, I always wondered, how could he ever come to power? Yep. I know now. Yep. After the election in November 2000, the House became an anti-civil unions chamber. They started having hearings about repealing the civil unions law. Beth and I had to go back and testify all over again, and it was an incredibly painful uh, period. They actively brought people into the State House to do seminars on the immorality of gay and lesbian people. Ultimately, civil unions was repealed on the floor of the House, but was blocked by the Senate. It was a, a helpful reminder of just how hard fought the civil union victory was and how hard we were going to have to work to move forward. What has been wonderful about Karen all these years and through everything that we've been through is that she's always been supportive of um, what Beth and I were doing. No matter how much time it took away from the household, um, no matter how stressful it was. Come 2003, my practice was taking off at the law firm, and I just didn't have the time anymore to devote to working for marriage equality. There was no energy for it in the state. Nobody wanted to do anything. The, the gay community was tired. The, the uh, political class was sick of hearing from us, and I was burned out, to be honest. I can remember getting home at 11 at night and you were going to pick me up at 6 the next morning, and so I had, you know, had seven hours to do my days of my job work, eat, eat dinner, sleep, visit with him. <laughs> Take a shower. Yeah. <laughs> Make breakfast and get up and do the same thing again. Yeah. I wouldn't trade the years of meeting really interesting people and traveling around and being engaged and getting to know the state in a way that I never would have. I wouldn't trade that for anything. So I know, it's not... but we were exhausted all the time. Frankly, I needed to take a break. I dropped out of the battle. So Beth, bless her, kept, you know, plugging away. As Susan's friend, I totally understood it. As her partner in this effort, I, I can't deny that it was hard at first. But Susan never went away. She was always a source of good advice, and she was always a friend. And in the meantime, a number of other really key people came onto the scene that, that might not have if Susan had, had stayed around. People like Sherry Corbin, who really was a pillar of the Vermont Freedom to Marry Task Force for a decade. And I remember covering miles and miles and miles of territory, walking into a house and the woman in the house running up and giving you a hug and then saying, good luck with him. <laughs> and then dragging her husband up and having a real debate about it. So the house itself was divided, but humorously divided. Freedom to marry crisscrossed all over this state. 
to hold a public meeting or to hold a, a house meeting, we would call them, and having nobody show up. Um, there were, that was frequently the situation. And we would go anywhere anybody wanted to talk. So number one, why marriage? Why are we doing this? Why is this important, especially after we went through all that we went through in 2000 to get civil unions? We were hitting every spot in the state. Wasn't the kind of work that was getting headlines, but it was the kind of work we knew we had to do to steadily rebuild. And when the story that our laws tell us a story of separation and exclusion, that affects every single one of us, gay and straight, single and coupled, old or young, uh, wanting to marry or not wanting to marry. It isn't just about the committed couples and same-sex relationships who want to marry. It really is about a broader civil rights movement and a broader movement for inclusion. And I have to say that for me, that that really is what this is about. Some of the hardest times were those long years in between when getting to the goal seemed so far away and so elusive and the work felt so not rewarding, but you knew you had to do it. Vermont created the atmosphere and the foundation to have this conversation on a national basis. I think Vermont's experience taught people how to talk about it, taught people that they could talk about it. After Vermont, Glad moved forward with a marriage case in Massachusetts. Good evening. It is one of the most contentious questions in America today. Should gay people have the right to marry? Today, the Massachusetts State Supreme Court ordered that state to do just that, legalize gay marriages, ruling that a ban on such marriages is unconstitutional in Massachusetts. Massachusetts became the first state in the country to allow gay people to get married, and they did that as a result of a uh, Supreme Court decision in that in that state and that case that was Mary Bonato's case that was her case she had you know as much as I whine about how hard we worked in Vermont she was carrying multiple other states at the same time she was doing the same thing many places that was huge now finally these couples who've been together years if not decades will finally have the chance to be treated equally and fairly by their government and have the right to join in civil marriage. We made the same key and core equality and liberty arguments that we had made in Vermont. And the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court broke that historic barrier and found that excluding same-sex couples from marriage violates that state's constitution. For a, a four-year period, Republicans dominated the legislature, so therefore marriage was off the table. And then Democrats took over the legislature again, and there was a glimmer of hope in Beth's eye about getting it done. We could have gone back to court. That was one of the options we considered. We wanted to rebut this notion that people's elected representatives would never go for this, that this is something that was being crammed down America's throat by unelected judges. It was important to pass marriage somewhere legislatively because the opposition was saying, take it to the people. The opposition was saying, the only reason we have marriage is because of courts. Nobody, no state had passed marriage equality by legislation. And that was our goal. Hi, how are you doing today? My name's Tom with Vermont Freedom to Marry. Would you like a pen? Thank you. You're welcome. Beth Robinson and Vermont Freedom to Marry, they went district by district organizing everyday Vermonters, gay and lesbian Vermonters, and family members very strategically. They would find people that went to high school with some legislators. They would find the, the right religious people. They would find the business leaders to talk to those people. They would find um, donors to the campaign and talk to these legislators. It was just absolutely brilliant, uh, and it was laser focused. Now is the time for action. Every single one of you who knows anyone, anywhere in this state, you need to call them. You need to call them and ask them to call their representative. Because minds can be changed like that. In the fall of 2008, we worked hard to try to get Senator Shumlin on board. We knew his heart was with us, and it was a matter of persuading him that the politics had changed and that he wasn't going to be taking his caucus, taking his people uh, into some fire where they were going to get burned. She had this determination about 
her message, and as did a number of other people in the room, in fairness to Beth, uh, where I thought, wow, if this woman and this group can really do this, we can actually get this done. Peter Shumlin knew that the house was where the play was going to be, and so he worked very closely with Chap Smith, who was newly elected as Speaker of the House. I always was interested in politics as a young kid, but I was reignited in my interest in politics, quite frankly, by the civil unions issue. I saw people uh, were willing to put their, their personal philosophy on the line, even knowing that they perhaps were facing political danger. I got a new faith uh, in what politics could do. The bill was very simple. It was a short bill. It wasn't a complex bill. It simply said that the, that the gender requirement in marriage would no longer apply, that, that a person can marry a person. We passed it overwhelmingly on the floor of the Senate, sent it over to the House, who did the same thing. We sent it to the governor's desk. We thought for sure, to be honest, that the Republican governor, Jim Douglas, would sign that bill. In all my great wisdom, Throughout the fall of 2008 and into the, into the early part of 2009, I had assured anybody who was concerned that Governor Douglas would sign this bill, or at a minimum, let it pass into law without his signature. I was convinced that Governor Douglas would not veto this bill. And I was wrong, very, very wrong. As you know, it's been a policy of mine not to announce whether or not I will veto a bill before it reaches my desk. But during these extraordinary times, the speculation about my decision has added to the anxiety of the moment and further diverts attention from our most pressing issues, and I cannot allow that to happen. For those reasons, and because I believe that by removing any uncertainty about my position, we can move forward more quickly beyond this debate, I'm announcing that I intend to veto this legislation when it reaches my desk. Our own governor stood up, called us a distraction, and said that our civil rights weren't worthy of attention this year and that he would veto them. <laughs> the task doesn't end with the governor. The task ends right here in the legislature with our leadership, with our elected representatives, uh, and the battle is by no means over. An hour later, Beth Robinson's in our door saying, we need an, a new ad in 24 hours. And we looked at each other and said, okay, we can do that. We are your neighbors, farmers, teachers, and clerks at the grocery store. We are your sons and daughters, your parents and grandparents. We are not a distraction, as the governor suggests. We seek nothing more nor less than fairness for all Vermont's families. Urge your representatives to protect civil rights for all Vermonters. They were promoting a view of homosexuality that would be palatable to the Vermont citizens and would pull on the, on the heartstrings of, of Vermont citizens. And uh, boy, some of their stuff pulled on mine, you know? <laughs> Suddenly we needed every vote we could get. We didn't just need a majority in the House and the Senate. We needed a super majority. We needed a two thirds majority in both the Senate and the House. Susan came back on board and rekindled some of those relationships that she had with the legislature, which was something we definitely needed. And the override votes in both chambers were scheduled for Tuesday morning. When I went home on Friday in the House, we had the 97 that we knew of because they were on record, and we had three people who had committed privately to supporting uh, the override, even though they haven't, hadn't voted for the underlying bill. Monday, when we got to the State House, we didn't have the votes anymore. One of the key votes a member had told some people they were voting no, and they told others they were voting yes. And I gotta tell you, when we left the State House the night before the vote to override, we didn't have the votes. And we knew we were short at least by one, possibly two. I pretty much cried the whole way home. It was the lowest time, I think, in the whole process for me. I felt tremendously supported by Kim, and I think that that was, that was the ultimate comfort through all of this. I can't imagine doing this or anything without her by my side. Floyd Neese was the majority leader uh, when I became Speaker of the House. Floyd is incredibly compassionate 
but forceful individual. The morning of the override vote, Floyd came and told me, I just got a call from the nursing home where my mom is, and they've told me that she is dying. I don't know what to do. And I said, look, Floyd, your mother's dying. There's no other option. You should go. And he said, I can't leave right now. Um, I'll leave as soon as the vote's over. We knew that we needed every single vote. And not only did we need the votes, we needed to have Floyd on the floor working people to switch their vote. Before the vote had happened, he got a call to say that his mom had died. And yet he was able to come to the floor and shore people up. It was really incredible. We had to make the decision to take it to a vote without having the votes in hand. And we determined that's what we had to do. When I came to the podium, uh, quite frankly, I was scared to death. So just as a reminder, yes vote is a vote to override the veto, and no vote is a vote to sustain the veto. The clerk shall call the roll. Adams of Heartland. No. Ainsworth of Royalton. No. There was sort of a feeling of terror, uh, but you also have to stand up there and look confident. So I was just trying to make sure that I looked like I knew what I was doing. We had one vote that nobody could talk to because he was so tenuous, and we had another vote that we didn't know what was going on. And uh, I'm not gonna name names, but I'll say that both of those votes came at the very end of the alphabet, which meant that we weren't really gonna know until we got through the roll call. Lewis of Derby. Oh. Lippert of Hinesburg. Yes. Lorber of Burlington. Yes. McAllister of Highgate. No. McCullough of Williston. We had those little pieces of paper and we were keeping track and it was extremely stressful. I had a very hard time um, composing myself to read the vote tally. Please listen to the results of your vote. Those voting yes, 100. Those voting no, 49. 100 needed to pass. You have voted to override the veto. The House will come to order. We'd been at it for 15 years, and a lot of people thought we'd never get there in our lifetimes, and we had. We'd done it, we'd won. political risks today because they knew it was the right thing to do and they have my gratitude forever i'm relieved i'm overwhelmed i'm i'm right along i won oh, to 49 i went back to my office closed the door and wept Vermont was the first state to grant statewide legal recognition to same-sex couples nine years ago. Now, Vermont continues its pioneering ways, becoming the first state to make same-sex marriage legal, not because of a court ruling on the constitutionality of the issue, but because the state legislature moved proactively to make it a new law. There were hundreds of people that were involved in this movement. This was not a gay agenda. This was a human agenda. I do want to recognize the Freedom to Marry board. They've been slogging away in obscurity for many years until we got to this last year, and it's been a lot of work. It's, it's not the kind of board you, you, you join to pad your resume. <laughs> it's the kind of board you join to be driven to the bone and then driven some more. <laughs> We're not done. Thank you. We're not done until every person who voted for this bill in the House and Senate has got a thousand thank you notes. And we're not done until every person who stood up and voted for this bill is reelected in November of 2010. <laughs> Marriage is a 
a vital package of legal rights and responsibilities. But it's also a symbol of acceptance by the state and by the community at large. When Karen and I got married, it meant all of those things and more. After two dozen years together, it was a way to finally show the world the commitment that we've always had to one another. We are so lucky to be alive now and to be experiencing these changes and to be part of making them happen. And we have come such a long way from being essentially entire outsiders to the Constitution to being slowly but surely brought in to those promises that are there for everyone. One of the great honors of being governor is that you get to appoint judges. So I went out and looked for the smartest, most capable lawyer that I'd ever met as my first appointment to the Supreme Court. There is no one more fair. There is no one more capable. There's no one with a finer legal mind. And there's no one who is more committed to justice, to integrity, and to doing the right thing for all the monitors than Ben Robinson. I bet Robinson? Do you solemnly affirm that I will faithfully execute the Office of Associate Justice? Do you solemnly affirm that I will faithfully execute the Office of Associate Justice? I'd like to think that I'm a better person because of the amazing people that I've had the opportunity to work with. Think about Holly and Lois and Nina and Stacy and Stan and Peter and Susan and Mary and the hundreds of people who invited me to their living room to talk to their neighbors. Every one of those people made me a better person. Anybody who's advocating for LGBTQ rights in any way, whether it's marriage or anything else, and whether the advocate is gay or straight or doesn't embrace labels at all, we need to understand that the human peace comes first. People's heads will follow if you get their hearts.